Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Stephen Arnold. Uh, Dr. Arnold is a professor of psychiatry and neurology at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine, and he, he is director of the Penn Memory Center. He's a board certified. Uh, he's board certified in both psychiatry and neurology. Please give a welcome to Dr. Stephen Arnold. Oops, here, let me get this. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really, it's my pleasure to be here. And what I'd like to do in, in about 20 minutes or so is give you a quick survey of how we think nowadays about the spectrum of aging and memory and thinking, what we call cognition, uh, and tell you a little bit from a more medical perspective how we think about it, how we diagnose, if there is a problem that's, that's um, happening, um, what the current treatment landscape um, looks like. And so this will be sort of an introduction to the, some of the disease processes that occur, um, or that can occur as we get older. Um, I'm going to actually start off telling you what normal cognitive aging is. So um, I did bring a number of slides, and I'm going to see if this will work here. Um, just, you know, I know it's hard to, to, to see, but... Um, Uh, sure, if you could, okay. yeah. So this is a little hard to see. The, this is where we're located at, at University of Pennsylvania. This is 36th and Chestnut Street, uh, Ralston House, which is one of the oldest buildings on, on campus. Um, and then in the last two years, we moved our clinical space over to the Perelman Center, for advanced medicine, um, just the prime real estate on campus, one of the newest buildings there. And I think that kind of shows the way that the health system is thinking about the importance of aging and memory um, that they've given us this kind of, of space to exist in. Next slide. Yep. Okay. So we're all getting older, um, and there are things that happen in terms of our cognitive abilities that are virtually universal. Um, everyone has more benign verbal forgetfulness. Remembering someone's name when you, you encounter them on the street doesn't come to you as, as, as quickly. Um, forgetting words, the names of, of different objects and, and things. Um, walking into a room, nonverbal forgetfulness, and, re, and trying to remember why did, you, why did I walk in there, you know, or where did I put my keys. Um, you know, these are things that we all experience throughout our life, but they do become more common as we get older and older. Some decreased attentiveness, general slowing, multitasking is a big thing, that we can't keep as many things going on in our head at the same time. Um, verbal fluency, coming up with words and expressing ourselves becomes a little more difficult as, as we get older. Um, next slide, Terry. Um, I, I sometimes like to ask the audience, and I'll, maybe I'll stand in front of the slide. <laughs> when, when do you think these, these um, changes start to occur? When do they, they start to accumulate? How old are we when, when 60? I hear 55. I say 70. 30, okay. 20? All right. We actually have a winner. <laughs> it, actually, it actually looks like we peak at around age 20, and it's kind of downhill from there. Um, now, not everything, not everything goes downhill from age 20. You know, if you look at verbal knowledge, you know, our knowledge of the world, this is a, and how much information we have, this tends to increase with our, our aging now. And it looks like there's a, you know, memory and everything is slowing down, knowledge about the world, perhaps even wisdom, if you will, kind of increases as we get older. There's sort of a sweet spot around 50. Um, so I've now passed that sweet spot uh, myself. And um, I don't know. But I was amazed when I actually started to review the, the, the literature and the data on when these kind of changes and what cognition looks like over the lifespan. 
Next slide. Um, but while that, that it looks sort of downhill, on average, you get these nice, clean kind of lines and slopes when you do the averaging. This is what life really looks like. Um, and so these are individual trajectories. Um, and you can see that as people, and this is a, a large study of um, actually a thousand, um, actually it's about 2,000 people in Chicago um, and throughout the country who are getting annual evaluations of their memory and thinking. Um, about half of these are older nuns, priests, and brothers. The other half are, are community-dwelling um, people. They've all agreed to annual cognitive um, testing, and actually they've all agreed to brain donation when they die so that the researchers can um, sort of match to see what were the changes in the brain that might have accounted for one person kind of plummeting in terms of their cognitive abilities and another person living a nice long life, you know, this blue line up here, um, without much cognitive deficits. So what we see is that there's a lot of variability among individuals. Um, overall, there does seem to be some slow uh, changes that are, 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 are common, if not universal. Next slide. But what, you know, when I say that we're going downhill, it's really happening within a pretty narrow range. Um, and what we're concerned about and what I want to start talking to you about now is when people fall off that normal curve. And that's when we become concerned with things that we now call mild cognitive impairment um, and, and dementia or um, uh, diseased aging or dementia. Um, when people really start to have some significant problems uh, that affect their day-to-day -day functioning. Next slide. Now, this doesn't show up very well, um, but this is a huge problem, as we all know. I mean, you can't read the, the, the Times or another paper any day without seeing some article on dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and, and, and the like now. Um, and from the age of 65, um, when Alzheimer's disease is pretty rare, through at least through the 80s or 90s, the, the, the prevalence, the rate of Alzheimer's disease doubles every five years, such that by the time we're in our mid-80s, about 40 to almost 50% of us will have Alzheimer's disease. So that's the, um, you know, that, that's some of the, the news. I guess, you know, it's good and bad, uh, because the good news is that Many more of us nowadays are living into our 80s. Um, you we're not um, you know, dropping dead of a heart attack when we're, we're 52 or, 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 or so. So you know, the older populations are the fastest growing populations in, in, in the country. Um, and in fact, the fastest growing segment in the country are, are the centenarians. Um, uh, and so when you kind of multiply the number of older people um, that are, are living into these ages where they're vulnerable to these kinds of diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, and you multiply that by what the rate is, if perhaps 40 or 50 percent, you can see what a public health um, uh, catastrophe uh, we're facing is. This is been a lot of economic uh, things right now. Actually, this is this slide I made about two years ago, um, and you know, if you compare the total health care costs of dementia care, um, it was a little bit less than cancer care in the in the country. Um, now that has changed, and dementia is now more expensive to care for. The amount of money that's pouring into to caring for people with dementia is now more than what we, we spend on, on cancer. Um, and most of that care, actually relatively little, only about 17% is due to direct medical care, going to the doctor, getting drugs, or, or um, you know, medicines and, and all. Most of it is in non-medical care, uh, and informal care in the form of lost wages for people who are taking care of their partners, their, their spouses, their, their family members. Um, in terms of research, you know, there's about six billion dollars that's uh, spent for research on cancer per year uh, from the National Institute of Health, uh, and there's a, less than a tenth of that for dementia uh, care. 
So, you know, I think that, you know, from an economic standpoint, there's a great disparity uh, in terms of how much is going to in uh, to, to deal with this. Next slide. Oh, and, and, in, and the projections are by 2050 um, is that in, in today's dollars, we're going to be spending $1.1 trillion on dementia um, uh, treatment and care, and that's about a third of the total federal budget um, that there is, if current projections go. So, I mean, this is a, a, not just a, 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 a personal um, suffering tragedy, it's also a, an economic uh, nightmare to think about. So a few definitions of terms. So I talked about what normal cognitive aging is, um, and that's when you know, you have variable changes in terms of, of the abilities, or, or cognitive abilities, that are virtually universal um, in older adults. Word and naming findings, you know, oh geez, what was his name again? Um, Nonverbal memory, where did I leave my keys? Multitasking, you know, hold on, one thing at a time. You know, just don't, don't you know, overwhelm me. Um, and a general slowing of information. These are the things that constitute normal aging. Now, when people start to fall off that kind of curve that I, that I talked about, um, we then start to use the term mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. Uh, and MCI is when there's a noteworthy, a notable decline in your previous cognitive abilities, especially memory, but also other things like language, spatial abilities, decision-making capacity, um, and so when there's, you know, so, uh, uh, people that know us, you say, well, there's really something significant that's changed. Um, and then if someone is evaluated with memory tests and things, you can actually compare how they perform on those tests to other people of a sil similar age, education, background, and the like. And you can see that they are performing less well than they should perhaps you know, below the 10th percentile of what would be normal for a person's age, education, and all. However, we use this term mild cognitive impairment when we see that those difficulties in memory and thinking, but a person is still able to take care of their daily activities. They're still able to manage their checkbook, pay the bills, um, go shopping, cooking, and things like that. So you know, we're seeing a definite change it's objectively measured, but they're still functioning. They may be slower at doing the, these things, um, but they're still, you know, their functioning in independent daily of activities is generally preserved. Now, for some people, many people who develop MCI, it just kind of goes along and they have MCI. For so other people, it could be the first stage of something more serious like Alzheimer's disease. Um, and when these changes um, become severe enough that they start to affect our day-to-day -day functioning, that we can no longer manage our checkbook, that we can't figure out how to you know, go you know, do shopping, that we can't do housekeeping or, or other independent activities of daily living that we need to do in order to be independent, um, when it affects our functioning, that's when we turn, use this term dementia. So dementia is a general term for when memory and thinking problems have declined and they're severe enough that they're really cutting into our ability to function independently. Next slide. Now, there's a very long list of things that can cause dementia. Um, there are the different kinds of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, things related to Parkinson's disease, um, some rarer conditions. People may have many strokes. Um, there may be thyroid uh, deficiencies. There could be vitamin deficiencies. Um, if the stomach loses its ability to absorb certain vitamins like vitamin B12, that can cause dementia. Um, certain kinds of cancer, you know, especially if it spreads to the brain, of course, could, could cause dementia. Um, liver diseases, HIV, um, various other infectious diseases, you know, these are known causes of, of dementia. But in older adults, could I have the next slide, Terry? Um, 
you know, when we look at the major causes of dementia in late life, Alzheimer disease is the big elephant um, uh, in the room. About 60 to 70 or 80 percent of all types of dementias, that, that long list, 60 percent to 80 percent of people who have dementia, it's due to Alzheimer disease. About 10 to 20 or 30 percent may be due to that what we call vascular dementia, mini strokes or 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 or, or strokes, um, uh, or sometimes a combination of Alzheimer's disease and vascular uh, dementias, and then you know five percent may be related to these things that we call Lewy body dementias, which are in the Parkinson's disease family. There's some other, you know, maybe 5% due to frontotemporal dementia, and then, you know, 2%, 3% due to that, the rest of that list. So these are the things that we deal with um, on a day to day basis at the Penn Memory Center. Next slide. Now, we know um, this actually is a picture of uh, Auguste D., who was the first woman who was reported to have what we now call Alzheimer's disease. She was actually in her 50s. She had an early onset uh, form of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and she lost her um, memory, or she was forgetful. She, had, um, she lost her naming uh, abilities, her language abilities. Uh, she developed some psychiatric symptoms. She, she suspected her husband was having an affair, and she became quite paranoid. But ultimately, she deteriorated over time to the point that she needed total care for everything she, and couldn't even move. And when she died, her doctor, Alois Alzheimer, looked at her brain tissue under a microscope and saw that, and again, it doesn't project very well, but um, saw that there were these um, things that were in the brain tissue under the microscope, things that he called plaques and tangles. And these now are still the way that we provide a definite diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So these are things that form in the brain um, of people with Alzheimer's disease, and they accumulate and they cause the death of brain cells um, and death of connections between the brain. Okay, next slide. You know, fast forward, we know a lot more about these, not enough, but we, we know a lot more about these plaques and tangles. We know that they're, what happens is that there are several, there are two proteins in the brain, one of them called amyloid and the other one called tau. And these are normal proteins, but for some reason in Alzheimer's disease, they start to fold up and crumple up these proteins and they lose their ability to function and they aggregate into these plaques and tangles, which lead to the death of brain cells and the connections between brain cells. Next slide. Um, so while we, you know, you still can't be 100% sure as to what caused someone's dementia um, unless you look at brain tissue under a microscope but after autopsy. Um, we've been developing a number of, of um, uh, x-ray type studies and other type of laboratory things that help us diagnose it early um, and perhaps even before someone has major dementia in this phase of mild cognitive impairment. So MRI, I mean, uh, how many people, who hasn't had an MRI in the, in the audience? Uh, um, you know, so MRI is one way that we are able to look at the brain and we can actually, um, you know, look at the memory areas of the brain. There's a memory area called the hippocampus, which is the major, one of the major memory areas of the brain. And in people with mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, it starts to shrink down. So even with an MRI scan, we can get a tip off that something's going on that's selectively affecting the memory area. Next slide. Um, PET scans are another kind of, of uh, X-ray study um, where you can look at how the brain is metabolizing um, uh, sugar, so how it's burning energy. And in a normal person, you see this nice brightness all the way around. Um, and so the brain is really kind of like, its engines are, are, are 
revved up and they're, they're moving. In Alzheimer's disease, you can see it, it's back here in the back part of the brain, it's quieter. There's not as much red. Um, and that means that the, the metabolism isn't really fired up. It's not going uh, there. And that's a pattern that's very distinctive with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then this is another kind of dementia, something called frontotemporal dementia, and you can see it's more in the front, whereas the back is, is, is preserved. Next slide. There's a new test you might have been reading about um, called, am so that I mentioned that protein amyloid that forms the plaques. Um, well, there's now a way to actually image with an x-ray test those plaques in the brain. Uh, with the, that amyloid. So this is um, uh, you know, an abnormal protein that shouldn't be in the brain. Um, and you can see in this normal person, there's not much red. In this person with Alzheimer's disease, um, there's a lot of red, so there's a lot of amyloid in the brain. And these are three people with mild cognitive impairment. And you can see this person um, doesn't have much red in their brain. Uh, and this person, when followed out a number of years, just stayed with mild cognitive impairment, did not get worse. Um, this person, within a year, had gotten worse to the point that the, it, they were called um, Alzheimer's disease. And this person has a little bit, and so it's not clear what is going to happen to this person. Is this person going to go on and develop impairments that we, to the point that we'd call it Alzheimer's disease or not? You know, that's really a, a, a big question. And next slide. And then another thing that we do very frequently um, at the Penn Memory Center, um, especially in, in our research uh, studies, is look at spinal fluid, um, where we can actually measure the level. So spinal fluid is a fluid that just normally um, flows up and down the, the back and around the brain. And, it, and um, you know, we do a, a simple test in the lower part of the back where we collect a tablespoon of, of the fluid that just pools down there. And we can actually measure those proteins, amyloid and tau. And what we have found is, is this is probably the best biomarker. Um, uh, but in people with mild cognitive impairment, if they have um, you know, this graph shows the rate of their developing Alzheimer's disease, the rate of their getting worse, or how many of them get worse. If their spinal fluid is normal, you can see after five years, most of those people are normal. But if the spinal fluid is abnormal, almost 100% of them within five years uh, do convert to what we would call Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we've gotten very good at diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, we also understand a lot of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, and we kind of divide these into things that we can change and things that we can't change. So we can't change our age, um, I'm not sure about sex, uh, family history, uh, APOE, um, is a gene that is associated with risk for Alzheimer's disease, and then there are other complicated genes. So these are things that we, we can't really change. And then there are things that are considered risk factors um, that we could do something about. So um, I mentioned the overlap between vascular disease and Alzheimer's disease. So thing, the same things that cause heart disease, hyper, high blood pressure, sugar diabetes, high cholesterol, um, those also are risk factors for developing dementia. Um, it's interesting, low education, people who have more years of education, higher degrees and things like that, they have a lower rate of developing Alzheimer's disease where people who haven't had you know, a, a much education um, uh, seem to be at higher risk and I think there's a lot of things that sort of load on to education. No, uh, hold, time. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quick. So other things that seem to be risk factors, head injuries, people who have had multiple head injuries, depression in, in midlife um, seems to be a risk factor for, for, um, uh, for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then other things that we're, we're kind of very interested in is people, intellectual stimulation, how intellectually stimulated you are um, is a risk factor. 
uh, I mean, if you if you're you know if you're a couch potato and and not really sort of stimulating yourself, interacting with people and things, um, you know that's a risk factor. Physical activity and social activity. Next slide. So you know the things that we recommend, you know, are kind of exercise uh, and friendship. Uh, seems to be a protective factor for Alzheimer's disease. Relaxation and maybe a glass or two of red wine seems to be good. Um, uh, Mediterranean diet are things that we we are recommending, and if you like them, I I personally hate them, but uh, <laughs> if you like you know uh, other forms of of, of cognitive stimulation um, like crossword puzzles and things like that. While we're good, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief because I want to have enough time for, for lots of questions, but um, you know, while we're very good now, I think, at diagnosing when someone's a problem, we're still pretty bad at treating it from a medical standpoint. You know, we have medicines, things you might have heard of like Aricept, Namenda, Razadine, Exelon. You know, these are medicines that are approved but you know, what I tell my patients is that they may provide some modest benefit for some people. And that's as ringing an endorsement I, as, as I, can, um, uh, I can give. Next slide. Um, you know, we do have, for people with mild cognitive impairment, we've developed um, uh, a program called the Cognitive Fitness Program, um, which is uh, now an eight-week program, twice a week, where people come in for about two and a half, three hours, um, and we go through a, a very um, uh, regimented program of ways in which to compensate for memory problems if you are having some memory problems, uh, different kinds of mental exercises and wellness and lifestyle kind of modifications that you can uh, practice uh, in order to um, improve and make yourself a little bit more um, uh, resistant or resilient uh, to the changes that, that could be occurring. Next slide. Research is a big thing, and I'll end with the, the, this. You know, we have a number of clinical trials of medicines, um, immune therapies, um, anti-tau medicines. We've got a, a surgical deep brain stimulation uh, program of, of um, uh, you know, that, that um, we're looking at to see whether it makes a difference in these diseases. Um, we're looking at some of those vascular risk factors, and if we use medicines, like for diabetes, could it actually help people with Alzheimer's disease, even if they don't have diabetes? So the research is, is a critical thing in order to move the field forward, and, and I think the next slide is the last. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, if we have some brochures over there. If you are interested, I mean, I think this field is not going to move forward without people participating in research. Um, we need to know what happens when people's brains are, are beginning to break down. We also need to know what happens, what keeps some people going strong into their hundreds um, without, you know, and what can we learn from healthy aging um, that, might, uh, that might really help um, us understand people who may be less fortunate. And um, next slide, I think that's it. So um, I just want to thank you for your interest. This is some of the people involved in the Penn Memory Center and our Alzheimer's Disease Center. Uh, and I'd like to open it up for questions. Yes. Yeah, so that. Dr. Arnold, yeah, can okay. Repeat the question because we're videotaping sure. and we'll be doing yep. that. And then going forward, if someone has a question, if you're able to come to the microphone, that would be ideal. If you're not able to come to the microphone, uh, we'll. I'll, I'll try to remember the question. Very good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, so so the, the, the question was, are there statistics from around the world um, on the rates and prevalence of Alzheimer's disease that might indicate whether differences in diet, you know, different cultural differences in diet or perhaps even other lifestyles make a difference? And there is a little bit of evidence of that. I mean, Alzheimer's disease is around the world, okay? This is a major thing. Um, there are some things that people are looking at in terms of diet. There are 
areas that um, do have higher rates of Alzheimer, it seems, whose diets may have more of that kind of, you know, cholesterol laden type of, of things. Um, you know, there's been interest in some populations, like in Okinawa, Japan, where people tend to have a very, very good, you know, heart healthy diet, get a lot of exercise, um, uh, and they seem to have a lower rate of, of Alzheimer's disease. But by and large, you know, I think within, you know, there's some interesting pockets that we're looking at, that people are looking at. Um, but by and large, it is a kind of a, 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 a global phenomena that we're seeing with aging. Yes? I have a loud voice. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so I don't need a mic. Um, you know, I hear about people with higher education. You hear about, you know, like President Reagan, you hear about the soccer coach, you hear about a lot of people with higher education. Now, is it because they're more out there or is it because, you know, it, it, it just seems to me that, like you, like you said, it would be lower education. But yet every, every person I hear that, uh, you know, has Alzheimer's, or dementia seems to have a very good education. Yeah, I think that that's just a, a kind of a, what we call a selection bias. I mean, who, who is it that makes the press that you actually hear about or, or read about? The numbers really are that people of, of you know, with lower education and um, also which tracks with lower socioeconomic status, um, that those people um, are at slightly higher risk, so it is a risk factor, but they are at higher risk for developing dementia. I think that, you know, hearing about Reagan and, and, and you know, others, you know, Sandra Day O'Connor's husband and, um, you know, others who have had um, Alzheimer's disease, you know, it shows that this doesn't just affect you know, one group of the population, you know, the people with excellent health care, lots of education, all the things, um, you know, that, that should promote good health, you can still, you know, this disease still hits. Um, but we're talking about relative risk when I brought up the, that statistics. Yes, yeah, you have. Uh, as aluminum absorption uh, it has been shown to cause uh, cognitive impairment? I would say that aluminum um, exposure has been definitively shown not to cause Alzheimer's disease. Um, that was, you know, back in the early 90s or, or eight, so the question was, does aluminum, uh, there was, there were a lot of reports about 20 years ago probably about aluminum uh, uh, causing Alzheimer's disease and all of that information came out of test tubes and mice and not people and when it was looked at in people, it looked like it was a laboratory error for the laboratory that was doing conducting that research. So, you know, the you know, and I remember, you know, and I still get questions, you know, if, well, should I throw out my aluminum pots and pans? And no, I mean, I have aluminum, you know, some aluminum pots and pans, um, and and that's that's really not. It hasn't been shown, you know, it does bring up the issue of environmental exposures and are there anything, you know, that insecticides, pesticides, um, you know, herbicides and, uh, you know, growth hormone um, treatment of, of animals. Nothing has been definitively shown to um, cause Alzheimer's disease. There's research on it, but nothing, unlike, say, Parkinson's disease, where farmers who use a lot of pesticides, herbicides, um, it has actually been shown that there's a link between exposure to, the, to those and developing Parkinson's disease. Um, but in Alzheimer's disease, no. Um, oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Arnold, first of all, I uh, thank you for appearing because my doctor had suggested I contact you and your program. Uh, I'm just surprised you're eminent in your field. It's very nice of you to be here to make a presentation. I didn't my pleasure. Nice to meet you. My question is, if someone were to enroll in the program that you have, is that an ongoing thing where you have to just keep at it over the years as you age, or would there be some improvement that might hold or last? Uh, you're talking about like our cognitive fitness program? Yes. Uh, so that is an, you know, what we're talking about, we do think that it is something that 
what we're trying to do is, is help establish a, a fitness program for you. Just like if you have a personal trainer for eight weeks in the gym, and is it going to carry over? Well, hopefully it's going to carry over after you stop with the personal trainer, um, that you're going to develop some habits and things that will keep that you will employ in your day-to-day -day life. Do you need some tune-ups every now and then? Maybe. Um, and and so that you know we're we're you know we we're we're offering that as well. Um, so it is just kind of like a distinct eight-week um, uh, program at this point. So, yeah. Uh, oh, you you had a question in the blue jacket. Yeah. There you go. <coughs> I have a great great aunt. She was born on Gullah Island off the, off the coast of South, uh, South Carolina. She's 113. Mm -hmm. Woman's got a mind like yep. that. Yep. She told me about when I was about 11 or 12, she said, it's been known that our family lives to be like between 110 to about 113, 114. Now I was considering that now she's a hundred and um, she's a hundred and twelve. It's amazing. Every morning, this woman walks five miles to her yep. a grocery store, walks back, does a gardening, her herbs, everything, and she can remember as far back as whatever one hundred and twelve years ago. <laughs> I'm sitting out there listening to her one day, and I said, "Well." And I was scratching. I said, well, Aunt Lou, I said, what do you remember? She said, oh, honey, I remember my first husband. I said, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> but she, her mind second, is, her, <laughs> the thing is, it's got me. I said, will this affect it? Because either though my family is long livers that the Alzheimer's will not, will hit me early in life or later in life or what? Yeah. This is what I'm, this so, is the thing that's got me puzzled. Right, right. So, I mean, it, it, it's got me puzzled too. Mm -hmm. um, so... So the, the genetics, you know, and your family, like almost any health issue, whether it's a health problem or um, a health advantage, um, you know, family history is important. Um, whether we're talking about heart disease or head disease, um, uh, you know, uh, arthritis or things. If something is in your family, it, it's, a, it's a factor that, you know, will goes generation to generation. So it sounds like you've got some really good genes floating around in there. Um, and, you know, we would love to study her uh, <laughs> and see what keeps her kicking. But, but the, other thing, well. the other thing that came to mind when you were talking was, um, you know, a friend of mine who actually runs that or is involved in that study um, of the, the people, you know, having annual evaluations and then autopsy, there, there's a 106-year-old guy on the south side of Chicago that, um, you know, they've been following for a number of years, and they say, you know, what's your secret? And he says, you stop, you drop. Um, and he just, mm. you know, he keeps walking, he keeps going. I think that's, um, what, I think that's her I, thing, because I, she's, she's constantly, constantly going. She's in the community. She plays the piano every, month, every Sunday at church. Yep. She yep. doesn't need a, what you call a... God, she just yeah, you know the things that I I, I mean I, I think you know the physical exercise is is really important the mental exercise social exercise being around other people interacting there's nothing more stimulating to the brain than that um, uh, and also the other thing that I've I think is important is maintaining a, a sense of purpose in life um, and that is something that keeps us us going uh, so as that well. guess that keeps her alive because she's 112 yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, Heshi. Yeah. Has there been any um, research done or uh, with folks uh, with long-term use of marijuana? Um, yeah. So today's 420, yeah. right? So. <laughs> um, uh, I've. <laughs> um, you know, I I actually looked a, a few months ago. I I did look into this and. There has been an, an extraordinarily, extraordinary lack of research into this very, very question. Um, it is not, it's beginning to pick up now, I think, with the whole medical marijuana thing, and people are finally beginning to look at, you know, evaluate it. But for years and decades, you know, it just was, you know, you 
you couldn't, you couldn't really touch it, you couldn't do much. The, from my standpoint, long-term use of especially, you know, more abundant marijuana, uh, or, um, you know, of, of, you know, frequent marijuana use, may cause some slowing down of executive functioning and initiative. Um, that's what some of the studies have been showing, mostly in, and all of the studies, I'm not aware of any study in older adults, um, but all the studies have been done in people in their 20s, 30s, maybe 40s, long-term users. Executive oh, executive functioning refers to um, sort of decision-making capacity, um, mental flexibility, uh, long-term planning, um, initiating activities, um, sometimes impulse control. Uh, so these are the things, kind of like the things that get us, sort of get us going, organize our, our, our world, um, and put the brakes on when we need to put the brakes on for, for long-term uh, planning. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> To go along with the pharmacology part of it, as a practitioner, is there any indication for any of the medications being started earlier in a treatment diagnosis or later on, or is there a difference of when you would decide to start treatment? Of the current medications that we have for Alzheimer's and other dementias, um, they're pretty much symptomatic treatment. They do not modify the disease process. So it's kind of like if you've got pneumonia, you've got a fever, you can give Tylenol, it brings the fever, but it's not going to touch the pneumonia, uh, really. And I think that that's what, we're, that's what we have now. So while we do use these medicines in people with mild cognitive impairment, there's no um, you know, really basis for treating people uh, you know, earlier than, than, than that. The research medicines that I alluded to um, those are designed to attack the, those amyloid plaques and those tau tangles. And so for those medicines, which we don't know whether they're going to work because they're still in, in, in research, but for those medicines, if we could identify that Alzheimer's disease is developing in the brain years, be, you know, and we know that it probably starts years or even decades before someone starts to have symptoms, if we could identify who's developing them, then intervening with those medicines would perhaps prevent mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. And that's why you know, the research is so important, because we really need to, to, to get the, at, at, the, at what we call disease-modifying um, drugs. One more question. Yeah, uh, one more question. So yes. You. Hi, I'm Mark, and I'm 65 and dyslexic. So I can't alter my age. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I live with bipolar two, which I call the sequel. And studies have shown that people with major mental illnesses, such as schizophrenia, bipolar, major depression, through life uh, ha die 25 years too young for a variety of reasons, ranging from obesity, from medication, side effects, uh, suicide, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I have, I have two questions. One is, um, does, how does that impact uh, major mental illnesses, uh, the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's? And secondly, uh, in planning ahead, um, are there programs where people who have major mental illness uh, or onset of, of memory issues, donate the brain to, for research? Uh, so the question was, you know, the relationship of, of ma major mental illness to um, risk for dementia, uh, and then the question about, you know, is there opportunity for people with these illnesses to actually donate their brains after they die, because you're still using it now. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so after, after you die, um, to donate their brains for, for research. Although you could donate it for an MRI scan. No, okay. uh, but, um, uh, so it, it's a very interesting area. I actually did quite a bit in my earlier career. I did a tr tremendous amount of work with that very issue of schizophrenia, which is one of the most severe 
men mental illnesses. And it does turn out that people with schizophrenia do have a very high rate of developing cognitive impairment and dementia. It does not look like it's an Alzheimer type dementia but it is a different kind of dementia. Um, and we actually were doing a lot of the post-mortem studies, so people who were in state institutions, you know, state hospitals and things, um, you know, we were doing autopsies, uh, um, and, uh, and it was quite a, a remarkable thing. So there are programs in which that is possible, and you could contact us, um, you know, about, about that. Um, for other illnesses, you know, we do know that depression and anxiety disorders in life is a, or anything that is really related to distress, um, you know, is a mo very modest risk factor for developing cognitive decline. People who have more depression, more anxiety, even if it's not like a major depression or a major anxiety disorder, they are at slightly higher risk for developing it. And the way I think of it is that it's kind of like a, uh, almost like a wear and tear on the brain, the brain, you know, that the chronic depression, chronic anxiety, chronic stress, um, you know, basically weakens the brain a little bit. So then you add a little bit of Alzheimer's disease pathology on it, and someone can, can you know, have more severe symptoms. Um, so I think, you know, aside from like watching your, your, your um, you know, blood pressure and, and exercise and things like that, it is important that you watch your your mood state, and if you are prone to depression, anxiety, whoops, um, that you do have, um, uh, you know, that you engage in some kind of treatment. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's give a round, another round of applause to Dr. Arnold, please. That was terrific, thank you very much.